up the island off the North Island's west coast. The whole centre of New Zealand lies open, from Mount Taranaki in the north to the beginning of the Southern Alps. In 1840, the lands as far as the eye could see were part of an empire. The empire was not British, but Māori. Its emperor was the great Ngāti Toa chief, Te Rauparaha. Poet, warrior and the greatest empire builder of Māori history. Along with his formidable lieutenant, Te Rangi Hata, he fought for Māori independence in the face of settlers from another empire, Queen Victoria's Britain. Governors Robert Fitzroy and George Grey represented that other empire and the colonising attitudes which ultimately sentenced New Zealand to a quarter of a century of war. Fitzroy was scrupulous but not brilliant. Grey was brilliant but not scrupulous. He was the most dangerous enemy Māori independence had ever faced. The 19th century expansion of the British Empire was built on convictions of superiority and the military power to make them real. But Māori leaders like Te Rauparaha and Te Rangahayata were determined to maintain control over their own lands and destiny. The 1840s saw the first confrontations between British sovereignty and tribal independence. Te Rauparaha was known as the Napoleon of the South. With a clever mix of force and cunning, he built his own empire in the middle of New Zealand, straddling Cook Strait. His strategic genius is obvious every time you look at Kapiti Island. Easy to attack from, difficult to attack. A perfect base for controlling the whole of central New Zealand. Kapiti was one of the keys of Ngāti Toa power, but another key was good relations with Pākehā. The whalers and traders of Cook Strait got food, land, protection and wives from Ngāti Toa and their allies. In return, they provided the flood of guns which gave the tribe an edge over its enemies. Te Rauparaha had a terrifying reputation among his Māori enemies. But in the infant town of Wellington, he was at first seen as a friend, though a potentially dangerous one. I don't think he ever laid a hand on a parka in any malice whatsoever. I think, he, I think he used the parkey as a tool to better himself. To get what he wanted, Te Rauparaha fostered good relations with the settlers. His canoe was regularly seen parked in front of this Wellington tavern, where he'd enjoy a few rums on the house. But the British settlers dreamed of building a better Britain of the South. They were not prepared to let Māori independence stand in their way. In 1840 and 1841, settlements were established at Wellington and Nelson. Te Rauparaha and his allies were surprised by the size of these instant townships, but they valued them for trade and money, and at first, relations were good. The honeymoon ended when the settlers tried to establish farms on land Māori believed they had not sold. One disputed block was a fertile Marlborough Valley, the Wairau. In 1843, both Māori and Pākehā laid claim to the valley. Land Commissioner William Spain was given the job of adjudicating between them. But before he had made his decision, the settlers went ahead and surveyed the land for themselves. In response, Te Rauparaha and Te Rangihata went to Wairau to support the local chief Puaha. Together, they expelled the surveyors and burned their hut. Europeans reacted strongly. Fifty armed settlers marched out from Nelson and travelled up the Tuamarino River to teach Ngāti Toa respect for British law. On the morning of 17 June 1843, the banks of this river witnessed a tense confrontation between settlers and Māori.
on the English side, the brave but excitable young Nelson magistrate, Henry Thompson. I have come to arrest you for burning the surveyor's hut. You must come with us. And the cooler head of Captain Arthur Wakefield. Order, men. Whatever you do, do not fire unless you get orders. Keep your eyes on them, my men. They have their guns pointed at us. On the Maori side, the Christian chief Puaha, who would go to almost any lengths to keep the peace. Don't fight. The Bible says it is wrong to fight. The land has become good through missionaries. Don't make it bad again. Te Rauparaha, who would go to considerable lengths. When Mr. Spain comes, we will listen to him. And if he says we must give up Waido, we will do so. And Te Rangihata, who would not go very far at all. Who is the Queen? What is the Queen to us? If you will not go, I shall be obliged to compel you. What I burned was my own property. The toe toe and the manuka of the hut was taken from my own land. My men are armed and they shall fire on you if you won't come. We did not go to England to interfere with the Pākehā. Why does the Pākehā come here to interfere with us? Have I burned your house? Have I destroyed your tents or anything belonging to you? Let the men advance! Oh, who told you to fire? Fifteen of the European settlers, who had little military experience, were shot in the brief but fierce struggle which followed. Four or five battle-hardened Māori warriors were also killed, and so was one woman. Te Rongo, a relation of Te Rauplaha's, was shot through the head. She was Te Rangihaeta's wife. Twenty of the surviving settlers fled for their lives. But a dozen, including Wakefield and Thompson, retreated in some sort of order to a nearby hilltop. Here, they tried to surrender, waving handkerchiefs as white flags. The natives won't understand the white flag! Kate, Kate, no! Ropraha, save me! Did I not warn you how it would be? A little while ago, I wished to talk with you in a friendly manner, and you would not. Now you say, save me. I not save you. Certainly, Thompson could not expect salvation from Te Rangihata, husband of the slain Te Rongo. He, uh, he just saw red, and uh, he couldn't be uh, contained. Right. And uh, he just went about it with, with the old uh, Mary and Hack hacked some of the people to death. After that surrendered? Yeah, after that surrendered, yeah. The weapon Te Rangihata used to exact his revenge on the settlers was this greenstone patu, Te Hekatua. Patua! Kia maro me te pūe hua te kua le tau! Kill them that they disappear as the dust that is blown by the wind! The prisoners were killed by repeated tomahawk or mere blows to the head, mostly administered by Te Rangihata himself in revenge for the death of Te Rongo. It's said that poor Henry Augustus Thompson tore his own hair in rage and frustration in his last moments, and some was later found clutched in the stiff fingers of his corpse. News of the Wairau provoked fear and rage amongst the settlers of Wellington, who had their own land disputes with local Māori in the nearby Hutt Valley. It's difficult today to imagine Wellington on a war footing, but between 1843 and 1846, tensions mounted and fortifications sprouted. The longer side of the town's defences ran from Willis Street along Manor's Moor to the old Bank of New Zealand corner, before the burger became king. They were made up of ditches and strong parapets. The other side went from Lower Cuba Street to the sea, the area where the 
Town Hall now stands. Governor Fitzroy came under increasing pressure from the Europeans to settle the score for the Waira by attacking Taropraha. But Fitzroy lacked the military resources for this, and he also had some doubts about the justice of the Pākehā actions. His successor George Grey had the resources and lacked the doubts. When he had finished with the war in the north, Grey brought his war machine, 800 imperial troops and several hundred sailors, south to Wellington. In February 1846, Grey's soldiers destroyed a village on disputed land in the Hutt Valley and evicted the Māori inhabitants. The local Ngāti Rangitahi, backed by their relative the Whanganui chief Te Mamuku and by Te Rangihaata, retaliated by looting settlers' houses during the month of March. In April, they took further revenge by killing settler Andrew Gillespie and his 12-year-old son. After that, the skirmishing died down and the British garrisons relaxed. It seemed as though the unfortunate Gillespies would be the first and last victims of Wellington's war. But at dawn on the 16th of May 1846, Tamamaku attacked a British post at Balcott's farm. His warriors crept across what are now the fairways of the Hutt Golf Club. I heard a shot. I called to my companion, look out mate, there they are. And we rushed and found about 250 natives fording the river. Some had reached the picket tent and were firing through it. We took up a position behind two trees that had been felled near the barn and fired volleys into them as fast as we could until the Maoris retreated across the river. We found a guard tent riddled with shot. Within it, the men were all dead and very much hacked about. The bugler had three cuts on his right arm, four on his left, three gashes on his forehead, and his mouth cut from ear to ear. And once more, he stole his bugle. And we afterwards heard them sounding it in the woods. The heroism of the bugler, William Allen, in trying to sound the alarm whilst he was being hacked to pieces, became the best remembered feature of the Battle of Bullcott's Farm. In legend, Allen a 21-year-old man, shrank into a small, heroic boy. His Māori killer grew into a giant. Seven men from the 58th Regiment were killed. A silver bugle became one of the prized battle honours of the regiment. During the winter of 1846, the Māori resistors withdrew from the Hutt Valley. Governor Gray shifted his sights to Porirua Harbour. His target was the firebrand leader, Te Rangihata. The British built a fortified camp here at Parimata, one of the very few stone fortifications to have survived from the time of the wars to the present day. Their warships, including the ultra-modern steamship Driver, patrolled the coast. There's a sense in which this Parimata base was intended as a strategic antidote to Te Raupraha's Kapiti. Ironically enough, it's said to have been Te Raupraha himself who suggested the site to Governor George Grey. Meanwhile, Te Rangihata, knowing coastal pa were vulnerable to warships, built his new pa a little inland at Paua Tahanui, on the spot where this church now stands. On the 1st of August, the British columns moved in for the attack. To their amazement, Te Rangihata abandoned his pa without a fight, and retreated inland up the rough and bushy Horakiwi Valley. The British chased him hard, but he checked their pursuit in a rearguard action five days later. It was a fierce skirmish, and it cost the British a dozen casualties. Rations were short and conditions tough. One exhausted soldier slept so soundly one night that he burned his boots and feet in the campfire before waking up. The British gave up the chase and Wellington's brief war ended. Te Rangihata withdrew to the Manawatu River, where he continued to defy British authority until his death nine years later. So why did Te Rangihata abandon his strong power at Pawatahanui? Why was Wellington's war so strangely low-key? One reason was that many local Māori still believed that the settlers were more useful than they were dangerous and wanted to maintain good relations with them at all costs. Even Taraupraha himself remained neutral in his power at Plymouthton, 
and tried to end or at least limit the conflict. The net result was that only a minority of the Ngāti Toa Alliance supported Te Rangi Hata, perhaps as few as 200 warriors. Against these, Grey brought his overwhelming force of imperial troops. In addition, a group of pro-British Atiawa and Ngāti Toa crossed the hills between the Hutt Valley and Pawatahanui in late July, threatening Te Rangi Hata's route of escape. It was they, not the British troops from the coast, who forced the evacuation of the pa. The final reason for the abandonment of Pawatahanui Pa, and indeed for a kind of British victory in the Southern War as a whole, was a decisive non-military blow struck by George Grey. Grey saw Te Rauparaha and Te Rangihata as a danger to the British Empire in New Zealand, but he also saw them as personal rivals and resented their refusal to acknowledge his superiority. In fact, Te Rangihata himself was, was really quite disparaging about the Pākehā. Now, if you take that in, in that in that period, in that context of that period, uh, this was a tremendous uh, slight, if you like, upon the Victorian gentleman. This had hardened uh, uh, Governor Gray to some extent, uh, so that he, he, he took on these plans uh, to reverse the situation. Gray resolved to cripple the leadership of the Ngāti Toa Empire at a stroke, by removing its emperor. His men set out to kidnap Te Rauparaha from his pa in Plymouthton. Te Rauparaha had been careful to maintain his neutrality, but Grey realised that the old chief was the key to Ngāti Toa power, and he decided to seize him, neutral or not. At dawn on the 23rd of July, 1846, five picked sailors landed at Plymouthton. They were backed by 200 troops and led by a young naval officer, H.F. McKillop. I, with my small party, ran on. Not a soul was stirring. We pushed on to the hut which contained the object of our search. Upon informing him that he was my prisoner, Rauprah immediately threw himself back into the hut and seized a tomahawk. I seized him by the throat. My four men secured him by his arms and legs. He roared most lustily, Nati Toa, Nati Toa. But the troops coming up prevented any attempt at a rescue, and soon he was in the boat. According to another account, the old chief struggled fiercely until a sailor grabbed his testicles and held on. True or false, the story symbolises both the morality and the effectiveness of Grey's tactics. The old man, looking the interpreter directly in the eyes, said bitterly, Shoot now. It would be better if I were dead among my own tribe than alive as a prisoner and slave in the hands of an enemy. Te Rauparaha was released in 1848, but he never regained his power and he died the next year. His Ngāti Toa empire was corroded, undermined and ultimately inherited by the British, whose claims to real control over Māori gained some substance in central New Zealand at least. On top of this, Grey and Te Rauparaha were ultimately quite similar men, uh, both brilliant, masters of words as well as people, capable of acts of humanity, but at the same time ruthless, driven, Machiavellian. There's a sense in which Grey had removed Te Rauparaha and slotted himself into his place, the sorcerer dethroned by the apprentice. <laughs> Apart from Te Rangihata and Te Rauparaha, the most prominent Māori leader in the Wellington War of 1846 was Te Mamaku. In 1847, after he'd returned home to Whanganui, he found that Grey's soldiers had come to the fledgling settlements at the mouth of his river. He challenged them to fight, trying to make it clear that his quarrel was with the soldiers, not the settlers. But six of his young supporters failed to listen and attacked a settler farm here at Mataraua, near Whanganui. The house they chose was the home of the artist John Gilfillan, his wife Mary, and their seven children. Gilfillan had spent much of his time recording cooperation with his Māori neighbours. Now his family were to become victims of conflict. In old age, his daughter Sarah still vividly remembered the events of the 18th of April, 1847, when she was just 16. My father and the Māoris were talking quite amicably when suddenly one of them struck him on the back of the head with a long-handled tomahawk. 
He staggered inside. The blood was streaming from my father's head. My mother bound it with a sky blue shawl belonging to the baby. While doing this, she continued to urge him to go away, and she felt sure it was only he who was wanted. At this time, no women or children had ever been harmed by the natives. Mary Gilfillan and her children were to be the first. She, her 14-year-old daughter, and two young sons were all killed. John Gilfillan and the other four children survived, including Sarah. But she was struck on the forehead with a tomahawk and bore the scar for the rest of her life. The chief Hone Wiedemu Hipango, along with many other Whanganui Māori who opposed to Mamaku, were outraged by the Gilfillan killings. They captured the six killers and handed them over to Pakeha Utu. Four were hung here on Rutland Hill in Whanganui Town. In late July, a small battle was fought outside the town at St John's Wood, with British and Māori sharing the honours. This ended Whanganui's brief war, and the first round of the New Zealand wars ended with it. Te Mamaku withdrew to the upper Whanganui River, his independence intact. John Gilfillan took solace in his painting. By the 1850s, people thought that the New Zealand wars were history. There was no fighting, and Governor Gray reported that he had succeeded in peacefully imposing empire on the Māori. Both races already form one harmonious community, professing the same faith, resorting to the same courts of justice, connected together by commercial and agricultural pursuits, and enjoying the same public sports. But sport and commerce were not empire. Twenty years after the Treaty of Waitangi, most Māori continued to rule themselves while trading actively with the growing settler population. For many Māori, this meant selling land, not only for the price it fetched, but also to get Pākehā neighbours. Up until the early 1850s, land selling accelerated. In Taranaki and Waikato, however, Māori found a way of plugging into the Pākehā trade without selling land. Using their own carts, canoes, sometimes even their own coastal ships, they sent their produce over long distances to markets in New Plymouth and Auckland. They did not need Pākehā neighbours to get Pākehā trade. This freed them from at least one of the pressures to sell land, and in their regions, a land-holding movement began to emerge. It advocated an end to land sales across the whole country. In the mid-1850s, this in turn led to one of the most important developments in the whole of Māori political history, the rise of the King Movement. I see no reason why any nation should not have a king if they wish for one. Why should the Queen be angry? We shall be in alliance with her and friendship will be preserved. The Governor does not stop fights and murders amongst us. A king will be able to do that. Let us have order so that we may grow as the Pākehās grow. After a series of great meetings involving many tribes, a consensus on kingship was reached. In 1858, a great general of the musket wars, Pōtātau Te Ferofero, chief of Ngāti Mahuta, was anointed Māori king. Although the king movement was centred on the Tainui tribes of the Waikato, support came from nearly two-thirds of the major tribal groups of the North Island. It was a remarkable development in Māori history. What we have here, I think, is something quite close to the birth of a Māori people as against a collection of disunited tribes. This was as important to Māori politics as Kawati's modern pa were to Māori warfare. At first, Pōtātau had good relations with the Pākehā, and he tried to make it clear that the King movement was no threat to them. But land sales abruptly slowed down. Māori began to look more united, and Māori independence looked more permanent. In 1855, Colonel Thomas Gore Brown replaced George Grey as governor. Brown wanted to get New Zealand's great future as the Britain of the South back on track. He needed a test case, a local incident which would restart land selling and teach Māori quickly and cheaply that the country was to be ruled by Queen Victoria and not by King Potatau. Brown found his opportunity here in Taranaki on the banks of the Waitara River. 
The British settlement of New Plymouth had been founded close to Waitara in 1842. For many years, it had cooperated peacefully with the Māori communities of Taranaki. But the settlers of New Plymouth cherished their dreams of a great future, and they thought progress was too slow. Well, when the settlers wanted to expand from New Plymouth, they weren't satisfied with the amount of territory they had available. And they were very envious of the vast amount of <coughs> produce that was being uh, brought out of this valley. <coughs> and they wanted to come out here and expand and use so what uh, wasn't in full use by the, by the Maori. They wanted to extend and uh, build new farms, break in new territory, and uh, do what they intended to do when they first left England. The New Plymouth settlers' dissatisfaction with the 60,000 acres of Taranaki land they had bought was intensified by their town's lack of a decent harbour. Waitara could provide a harbour and unleash their retarded progress. But between them and Waitara stood the Atiawa chief, Wirimu Kingi Terangitake. During the Wellington War of 1846, Kingi, who was then living in Waikanae, had supported the British against Te Raupraha. In 1848, he and his people returned home to the Waitara, to their ancestral lands, where a few of their kin had been keeping the fires of ownership burning. Wirimu Kingi was determined not to sell. Listen, Governor, I will not permit the sale of Waitara to the Pākehā. Waitara is in my hands. I will not give it up. I will not. I will not. I will not. The tribe split into two factions, landholders and land sellers. Between 1854 and 1858, these two factions fought quite a bitter civil war in which something like a hundred people were killed and wounded. The landholders were led by Widamu Kingi and openly supported by the tribes of South Taranaki. The land sellers were secretly supported by the settlers and led by Taira Manuka and Ihaya Te Kirikumara. The Atiawa feud ended in 1858, but the very next year, Taira offered 600 Waitara acres to the government. He, the senior chief, vetoed the sale, but Taira, backed by Ihaya, persisted with his offer. With the Atiawa divided, Governor Gore Brown seized his chance to teach Māori who really ran the country. Ignoring the ruling of the senior chief, he accepted Taira's offer. His Excellency the Governor has instructed the Honourable Colonel Gold to take possession without delay of the land at Waitara sold to the Crown by Te Teira. When Governor Gore Brown sent his land surveyors onto the Waitara block in February 1860, Weiramu Kingi supporters turned them back. So the Governor sent in his troops. The first shots of the Taranaki War were fired here on the 17th of March, and New Zealand plunged into conflict. This is the place where New Zealand's great civil war of the 1860s began. You can imagine what the equivalent site in the United States would be like. 300 foot monument, tourist mecca. In New Zealand, this is it. British troops in Taranaki were commanded by Charles Emilius Gold of the 65th Regiment. He was arguably a better painter than a soldier, and he was not a very good painter. Gold fortified New Plymouth and a few other posts, and made occasional forays outside the town. But outlying settlers felt unprotected and vulnerable to raids by Māori. Settlers were killed, refugees streamed into town, farms went up in smoke. Settler militia and volunteers prepared to do battle alongside the Imperial troops. Tensions inevitably developed between the soldier settlers and the Imperial regulars. Insults flew and fights broke out in the town's pubs as they skirmished among themselves. But the real fight was soon to begin. Wairaka, south of New Plymouth, was the site of the first battle proper of the Taranaki War. On 28 March 1860, two columns of troops, one of Imperial regulars and the other of settler militia, marched out from New Plymouth against Māori raiders. Their objective was the Kaipopo Pa, believed to be the main base for Māori raiders. But as they marched across this headland, both columns became entangled in skirmishes with small Māori parties. 
To the disgust of the settlers, the regulars withdrew, leaving the militia apparently in the lurch. In the nick of time, the story runs, a party of 60 sailors came to the rescue, storming the part which the raiders were believed to be based and killing dozens of chiefs and scores of lesser mortals. The sailors were led by Captain Peter Craycroft, commander of Her Majesty's ship, Niger. He offered ten pounds to the first man inside the park. In taking the par, the Royal Navy men claimed to have killed or wounded up to a hundred Māori, while suffering only four casualties themselves. Coxswain William Odgers not only received the ten pounds for being the first man into the par, but also the illustrious Victoria Cross, the first of the New Zealand wars. The militia were able to withdraw safely to New Plymouth, where the Imperial sailors became heroes and the Imperial soldiers became villains. Hurrah for the brave hearts who fought for the fair town when the battle smoke shrouded Wairekka's green veil, when the long demon yell of the merciless Maori defied the deep slogan of Saxon and Gale. Ah, gory Wairekka, thou'lt ne'er be forgotten. But the so-called Great British success at Wairekka was a myth a classic example of a paper victory. Māori at the time are said to have described the British victory claims as all fudge, and settler Arthur Atkinson subsequently learned that they were absolutely right. Paris tells me that the two Napuhi boys lately sent home had a long conversation with him. According to them, there were no men killed at the part by wrecker. This account agrees perfectly with two others from independent sources, Riemann Schneider and Messenger, who went up to the par with the storming party and when inside, couldn't see anyone to stick or shoot. It's true that several important chiefs fell in the other skirmishing around Wairaka. But on balance, the evidence suggests that the scores of Māori alleged to have been killed when Captain Craycroft and his merry men stormed the Kaipōpō Pa, in fact numbered about one. William Odgers, VC, must have thought all his Christmases had come at once. He spent most of his £10 reward on a binge in Auckland's Queen Street, but saved some to have this photograph taken. For three months after Wairaka, British and Māori continued to destroy each other's houses and cultivations and threw up par in fortified camps. Both sides focused on getting reinforcements. More Imperial regiments arrived to join the 65th, the 14th from Ireland, the 12th and 40th from Australia, and the 57th from India. Eventually, over 3,000 Imperial troops were based here at New Plymouth along with several hundred local militia and volunteers, a hundred so-called friendly Māori, and the crews of no less than six warships. Wudamu Kingi and his South Taranaki allies now faced the assembled might of the British Empire. And the big question was whether they could find enough reinforcements of their own to make a fight of it. Their only chance of really substantial help lay with the newly formed Māori King movement. The Kingites were divided on the question of war with the Pākehā. Wiramu Tamehana Tarapipi of Ngāti Haua, known as the kingmaker and now recognised as the outstanding statesman of his day, Māori or Pākehā, wished to unite Māori but not fight the Pākehā. I seek some plan by which the Māori tribes should become united. They should assemble together and become one like the Pākehās. I do not desire to cast the Queen from this island but from my peace. I am the person to overlook my peace. Another influential Kingite leader, Rewi Maniopoto of Ngāti Maniopoto, was less peacefully inclined. Pākehā portrayed Rewi as a firebrand and warmonger, but it is fairer to call him a realist. If the governor could impose his will on Wiramu Kingi and Taranaki, who would be next? To decide which view should prevail, the King movement sent a delegation to Taranaki to investigate the causes of the Waitara quarrel. The envoys came down against the land sellers and took their findings back to the king's capital at Naruawahia. King Pōtātau had just died and been replaced by his son, Tafia. Rewi Maniopoto asked the new king for permission to send a war party to help the Atiawa. King Tafia agreed. Governor Brown's attempt to impose sovereignty on the cheap had backfired badly. Rewi ordered his warriors to Taranaki. The Ngāti Maniopoto party was not large, 140 warriors in all. It did not represent a full-scale commitment of the king movement to the Taranaki war. 
But what it did do was significantly broaden Te Atiawa's support and give them a chance of attempting something really major against the big British forces. William Marjoram, a 32-year-old sergeant from Suffolk, was one of several hundred soldiers based at the Waikara. He was a reformed alcoholic who had turned to the Lord. June 27th, a most memorable day. At three o'clock this morning, we were turned out and marched towards the Pukitakaweri Par, about a mile distant. Our silent march through the darkness was gloomy enough. The morning was raw and stormy, and to heighten my distress, I fell into a ditch of water. The par at Pukitakaweri, built by Tiatiawa, was just a couple of kilometres east of the Waitara and right under the British noses. Looking back down on the British position today reveals just how close the par was. Its very existence was a challenge, one the British had to accept. We opened fire with a cannon at seven o'clock. Having destroyed a portion of the stockade, Major Nelson determined to take the place by storm. The park consisted of two low hills. What seemed the main Māori fortification was built on the southern hill, Anuku Kaitara. It had a prominent flagstaff. Puketa Kaere proper, a short distance to the north, appeared to be lightly defended. It was the Atiawa chief Hapurona, said to be a fiery little man of great military talent, who devised the Māori battle plan. Anuku Kaitara Pass seemed strong, but it was really a false target designed to distract British attention from hidden Māori entrenchments. Puketa Kaere, on the other hand, seemed weak, but it too had hidden defences. A British division under Captain Messenger crept through the bush to take the Māori positions in the rear by surprise. It was they who were surprised. The division lying in ambush at rear of the par was attacked by a large body of natives who rushed down from the bush and overpowered our men. The fight that ensued was fearful. Many poor fellows belonging to this division were driven into the swamp. The natives rushed upon them like tigers, tomahawking the wounded in the presence of their comrades. As for those who escaped, their deliverance was a miracle. As the main body under Nelson advanced on the par from the front, his troops too were ambushed by the Māori from hidden trenches. Rebels were now advancing from all quarters. About this time, one of my gunners suddenly fell over, casting a look at me which I will never forget, and at the same time crying, I am shot! The ball had entered the hip, passing out through the groin, and afterwards passing between my legs. All who were able to return to camp about 11 o'clock, disheartened and dispirited. They didn't give the Maori credit for being able to work this type of warfare. And that's where they made the disaster. So brilliant were Hapurona's tactics, that the British assumed that they must be the work of Europeans. Rumours flew that white men had been seen leading the Māori during the battle. The truth was that the British had been defeated by Māori brains, not European ones. Hapurona succeeded in ambushing the British from concealed positions prepared in advance, not once, but twice. But on top of this, the very essence of the success of his battle plan was that he used the same warriors to attack Messenger's division on this hill and then move them across to attack Nelson's division on that hill. In short, the Māori fought one battle while forcing the British to fight two. Our loss amounted to 32 killed and 33 wounded, about 18%. Thank God my life was spared. What an awful thing to fall into the hands of these unmerciful savages. The sights we witnessed today were truly horrifying, nor can they ever be erased from my memory. After the disastrous defeat at Pukitakaweri, the British remained largely on the defensive. Meanwhile, Te Atiawa obtained more reinforcements from the King movement. As the costly and unnerving war dragged on to the end of 1860, many settlers blamed the frustrating lack of success on the Imperial commanders. Jane Maria Atkinson had some harsh words to say about Colonel Gold. There does not seem to be an ounce of brains among the officers. The utter incapacity and monstrous stupidity of almost all at the head of affairs becomes daily clearer. Colonel Gold is a pompous old fool, so touchingly dense in his stupidity that you can view him as a gigantic baby. 
Gold was no genius, but to some extent he was being made a scapegoat for good Māori strategy. The Māori were part-timers fighting full-timers. Unlike the British, they had no professional army. They solved this problem with what amounted to a kind of shift system. Small groups of warriors would come to the battlefront in Taranaki, remain for a few weeks involving themselves in the fighting, then return home to renew their supplies. They would then be replaced by other groups. This constantly recycled Māori army was able to pin the British inside New Plymouth with dozens of mass-produced modern pa. Each individual pa was fully expendable, but together they constituted a kind of cordon which gradually began to strangle New Plymouth. If a small British force attacked a pa in the cordon, as Nelson had done in June of 1860, it would be hammered. If a large force tried it, then the particular pa would simply be abandoned and replaced by others. In effect, each expensive British thrust was absorbed by the par cordon as though it had been banging into a cushion, and it gradually began to dawn on the British that there was simply no point in taking empty par. Sing a song of sixpence, a tale about the war. Four and twenty niggers cooped up in a par. When the par was opened, not a nigger there was seen. Is not that a jolly tale to tell before the Queen? From the safe bases of their par, the Māori were able to mop up the New Plymouth settlers' property and livestock and tighten their siege of the town. Whereas active military operations are about to be undertaken by the Queen's forces against the natives in the province of Taranaki, I do declare that martial law will be exercised throughout the said province. For the settlers, it meant living by proclamation. Notice is hereby given that the sale of arms and ammunition without a special license will subject those persons to trial by court martial and, if convicted, to suffer death. Where possible, women and children were sent to safety in Nelson and Auckland by ship. As it is necessary that families should leave this town, they must prepare to embark to such places as shall be decided upon. Those who remained weren't allowed to venture beyond the town's limits. Crowded conditions and lack of supplies meant disease was rife inside New Plymouth. 121 settlers died of illness during the war, a hundred more than the usual death rate. These people were as much victims of the Taranaki War as soldiers killed on the battlefield. It was a tense and fearful existence. I saw the smoke of cannon and heard the dreadful booming of the report and immediately a stream of women were to be seen hurrying up the steep path into the barracks. Some women with a child under each arm, without either hat, bonnet or shawl, some with a bundle hastily thrown together and many seemed utterly bewildered amidst the confusion and noise of women crying, children screaming and the eager, anxious questions to know what it was all about. Even Sergeant Marjoram began to despair. This once beautiful province is now desolation, destroyed by the ruthless hands of the savage Maori. Our position is very perilous. We are beset by savages on every hand. Lord, thou can save the helpless. Again, I pray to thee to have compassion on my wife and child and upon all the helpless in New Plymouth, for Jesus Christ's sake. On the 5th of August, 1860, God answered. Major General Thomas Simpson Pratt commander of all the British forces in Australasia arrived. Pratt was a 63-year-old veteran of wars against the French, Chinese and Indians. Along with his leading subordinates, Colonels Thomas Mould and Robert Carey, he devised a plan to win the Taranaki War. The plan was based on sapping, the process of digging protected trenches up to a fortification until they were so close that an assault from them could not be stopped. The trenches were lined with gabions, cylinders made from brushwood and filled with earth. For the first three months of 1861, Pratt sapped on a grand scale, digging his way through a series of power on the Waitala River and building no less than eight big redoubts of his own to hold the ground gained. And it seemed to work fairly well except the odd head got hit by Maori sharpshooters firing from up top, from there, and also uh, long haul stuff from, from uh, the long hill across there. They were firing into the sap, this type of trajectory, and they, they got a few. They were not too completely happy with it. In this little stage of the manner of making it, the uh, soldiers would retire to the redoubt, 
when they came back in the morning, most of their, most of their work had been filled in. This is all that remains of General Pratt's long sap. The hitch with the whole system was that sapping was a siege method. It was designed to take positions that were completely encircled, that had no route of escape. In Taranaki, of course, Māori pā always did have a route of escape. So here, sapping was a siege method without a siege. When Pratt's sap came too close, Māori simply abandoned their pā and moved on. Pratt's saps did dig deep into the Māori pā cordon, threatening to breach it eventually. And they did provoke a brave but unsuccessful Māori attack on Number 3 Redoubt on the 23rd of January, 1861. This attack was the worst Māori mistake of the entire Taranaki War. It cost them at least 40 lives. During the trench warfare of early 1861, Māori raided the sapheads, ambushed British working parties, and tried every trick in the book to confuse the enemy, including mimicry. The natives were sounding regimental bugle calls and amusing themselves by calling out in excellent English the various military commands, such as, to the right incline, fix bayonets, now, my lads, charge! Above all, they strengthened their own defences, building new par as Pratt chewed up the old. So while the British dug away on one side of the par cordon, the Māori dug away on the other, and the whole strange spade race might have ended up in Gisborne in another 50 years. Realising this, the British negotiated a truce with Hapurona, and in late March 1861, the Taranaki War ended in stalemate. As the fighting ground to a halt, leading settler James Richmond wrote, General Pratt and his sappy procedure would absorb 10,000 men at the Waitara and look for more. We are all, I think, more depressed and hopeless than ever. General Pratt's conduct begins to look more and more idiotic. Richmond's brother composed the first Pākehā nursery rhyme. General Gold was not very old, and General Pratt was not very fat, but all the motions of General Gold were as slow as if he'd been fat and old, and all the motions of General Pratt were as slow as if he'd been old and fat. The Richmonds were unfair to Pratt and Gold, who after all could not really be blamed for Māori's skill. But they were not unfair about the overall result of the Taranaki War. Wurimu Kingi did lose the Waitara, he and his allies did suffer other losses in people and resources which they could ill afford. But when books published in London claimed that General Pratt had led an ever victorious army, the New Zealand settlers laughed bitterly. Only a tiny minority of Te Atiawa actually made formal peace. The New Plymouth settlers lost £200,000 worth of property, 7,000 acres of territory, and their great future was placed on hold until the advent of dairying in the 1880s. Above all, the British failed in their attempt to crush Māori independence on the battlefields of Taranaki. Governor Gore Brown and the leading settlers brooded on this. They realised that the King movement and its shift system had been the backbone of Māori resistance. They concluded that there was only one way to cripple Māori independence. Breaking the King movement by invading its Waikato heartland. <laughs> 